Okay, so let's get started. Welcome back. Uh, so what we will do is there were a couple of slides that I had to cover in a rush at the end of lecture one. Just going to go through them quickly and then we will switch to today's topic, uh, which is going to be on system architecture. Okay. So what I was discussing at the end of last time were distributed operating systems. And what I said was a distributed OS kernel is one where uh, the OS provides the abstraction of a single logical machine. The OS runs on multiple machines, a cluster. Here it's shown running on three machines, A, B, and C. But the applications don't see this individual machine. They see a logical machine which has all the aggregate resources on those three individual machines. So the, uh, the scheduling, all of that is actually handled internally by the OS and the presence of these machines is hidden. So it looks like a distributed system, but logically unified from the application and user standpoint. Okay? And then we have what is called a network operating system, which is uh, different from a distributed operating system. In a network OS, that's a, your traditional OS that you run on your desktop or a laptop. Uh, the presence of other machines is visible to you. All that the OS is doing is allowing you to communicate. There are network OS services which allow you to set up TCP IP connection. They allow you to do SSH. They allow you to uh, use HTTP to communicate with other machines. Okay? So essentially all general purpose operating systems today are a form of network operating systems. Okay? They still allow you to run distributed applications except that the applications need to figure out what components run where and explicitly communicate with those components on those machines. So the presence of these nodes is visible to the application and has to be explicitly managed by the user or the application. Okay? That's a network OS. Okay? And there are examples of one such application which is essentially a file server. Okay, in this case, you have your files stored on one server. The other machines run a network OS that allow them to access files stored on another server. An example of such a file system could be NFS or network file system, which we will cover when we get to the file systems component of this class. Okay? All that I'm trying to say here is the OS enables the clients to access files on another machine. The presence of the server is actually visible to the user because you see network volumes mounted from the machine. Okay? Yes, question. Isn't it similar to workstation? This is what we, we are talking about, the architecture of operating systems. Okay? We are not talking about client server model or anything like that. Right? And then we have the middleware based operating system, which uh, I hope the fire alarm hasn't gone off. Um, we'll see. Uh, so the middleware based OS essentially takes a network operating system and adds a software layer on top, as is seen and presents abstraction similar to the distributed OS. So you can take any network OS and add the software layer and make it look to the applications as if they are running on a distributed OS-like system. Okay? Is that clear? So there are these three flavors that you should know about. There is a table here which talks about the degree of transparency which reduces as you go from a distributed OS to a network OS. And then there are many other characteristics which I'm not going to go into here, but something you should go and look at. And if something is not clear, come ask me. Okay? That's just to uh, recap what we were doing last time. And what I'm going to do now is essentially switch to today's topic, which is architectures for distributed systems. We are going to use uh, essentially not use, but have three different parts to the lecture. Okay, the first module is going to be on architectural styles. Then I'm going to go a little deeper into the client server architecture, which is a popular one okay, that is used in distributed systems. And then we'll talk about a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, which is a complement to a client server architecture. Okay, so Okay, so mod, the first part is going to be an architectural styles, and uh, we'll talk about several different ones in the next few slides, starting with layered, object-based, and data-driven, and whatnot. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which is the layered architecture. Uh, so in this case, your entire distributed application is split into a set of layers, okay, n layers. Okay, so the, the layers stack up, and each component, or each layer, can communicate with the layer above it and the layer below it. Okay? 
So, a layer i cannot communicate directly with layer i plus 2, for example, it can only communicate with i plus 1 and i minus 1. Okay? That is a restriction of the layered approach. Okay, last time I mentioned this and I said that the network protocol stack in an OS kernel follows the layered mod. Today I am going to talk a little bit in a little bit talk about web applications and show you that modern web applications also follow the layered approach okay, and that is more relevant to the class. Okay, Here is a different model which is object oriented mod. Okay, in this case your distributed application is split across a set of components. Okay, They are called objects. Okay, so, if you have written Java code you know what classes and objects are. Okay, so, in this case the objects are actually distributed across multiple machines. This is a distributed application. Okay, unlike a centralized Java program where all the objects reside in one process, in this case these objects are actually on different machines, but and they communicate with one another. Okay. Any object can call methods on any other object. Okay. So, you will see that in this case, this is in some sense a generalization of the layered approach because there are no restrictions on which object can communicate with which other object. Okay. The layered approach you could only talk to two other layers. Okay, the one above and the one below it. In this case, you can design your application. So, any object can invoke methods on any other object. Okay. The mechanism by which they invoke methods is called remote method invocations or RMI, something that we are going to get into a couple of classes and lectures from now. Okay. That is not important here. All you need to know is that these objects interact with one another over a network. They are not going to reside on the same machine. Here is yet another model which is called an event based architecture. It is also called a publish subscribe or a pub sub model if you have heard of pub sub architectures before. Okay. So, what happens in this case is there are components of your application. Again, it is a distributed application, it has components and they interact by publishing to publishing data or events or subscribing to data or events. Okay. The communication is, uh, uses what is called a publish subscribe model. Okay. So, here is a component at the bottom that has published a data object or, a, or some data. Okay. It is going to be published to what is called the event bus, which is simply a logical abstraction that enables components to communicate with one another. Okay. So, the event bus is essentially just enabling communication in this case. Okay. Component 1 might publish a data item. Okay. Component 2 might subscribe to certain kinds of data items. So, what the event bus would do is whenever a new data item is published, it is going to check for a match saying is this data item of interest to this other component, have you subscribed to these types of data items. Okay. If so, you will deliver that event okay, or that uh, data item to that component, if not you will just queue it, maybe some other component might need it later. Okay. This is called a publish subscribe model. Okay. We will come back to this and talk about this in quite some detail later on. Okay. All this. Uh, you need to know now is there is such a model that exists and what the way of communication is not explicit. Okay, you are publishing and you are subscribing to events. Okay. Unlike other architectures where you explicitly send messages to certain objects, in this case you are just publishing and subscribing to events or data items. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. So, here is yet another model which also we will get to in some time. This is called a shared data space model. Okay. It is also called blackboard architectures, if you heard of this term before. Okay. So, in this case, the coupling between components is very loose. Okay. In fact, they are decoupled in what is called space and time and maybe that concept is not may not be yet apparent, but what essentially happens here, it also uses a form of a publish subscribe model except that it is a very loose form of communication. The best way to think of this is think of a physical bulletin board. Okay. You might go to your the kitchen in the computer science building, there is a bulletin board there where people post notices. Okay. Maybe somebody is trying to sell furniture because they have graduated. Okay. They put up a notice saying I am going to sell all my furniture and they have tags that say if you are interested contact me. Okay. So, you walk in, you take a look at the bulletin board, if something catches your eye, you make a note and then you contact that person. Okay. This architecture uses a very similar framework. Okay. Components might publish data items, but they are not meant for anyone, they are general announcements. 
Okay. Later on, some other component might come along and look for an announcement of interest, and if it finds one, there is a match, and then you basically pick it up. Okay. So, there are many scenarios where this might be useful. So, for example, you might think of a printer that just advertises its service. So, you put a note saying, I am a printer, if you are interested in printing something, here are the details. Okay. Some component comes along later saying, I need to print in this environment, and then look for a printer, you find one, and you print. Okay. So, so, in some sense, it is loose decoupling between what is being published to this bulletin board and what is being requested. There is question in the back. Okay. The question is, how is the shared data space is different from the event based model? So, in the event based model, there is explicit publish subscribe that is going on, where the ma matchmaking is continuous. Okay. So, you publish a data item, if somebody is subscribed to it, you basically deliver it immediately. Here, you might publish data items and they might stay in the bulletin board for long periods of time. Okay. So, the way to that is the way to think about it. So, an event based architecture is similar to a mailing list, you might miss, you might subscribe to a mailing list and whenever somebody posts, it gets delivered to you immediately. In this case, it is like a bulletin board, you do not address it to anyone, you just post it and then some other component comes along later. Okay, so, the communication is decoupled in time. Okay, and we will get back to this in more detail. This is just a high level overview. Yes, question. Does this, the question is, does this require centralized server? So, so what the, the cloud here that you see here is called a shared data space. Okay. So, that is where you are going to think of it as a very loose form of a database, but distributed. So, you can publish to this database, event set or announcement set there, you can subscribe to it at a later point and so on. Okay. Now, is this a centralized server? You need not be centralized, it could be distributed. Okay. This is after all a distributed system, so you may not have a centralized, it is called a tuple space actually. You do not need a tuple space, it could be a distributed tuple space. So, there will be servers or machines that enable this communication, but they do not have to be centralized. That is the short answer to your question. Okay. So, you can do this in a distributed manner. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So, the last one that I want to talk about before switching gears is called resource oriented architecture. Okay. This is something you may have actually encountered. An example of a resource oriented architecture are RESTful web services or REST architectures as they are called. Okay. So, what does this mean? So, in this case your application is uh, split into what are called resources which could be data items and so on. Okay. And other components are actually ask for resources through an interface. Okay, they access resources, they perform operations on resources and so on. Okay. Uh, RESTful web services are an example of this. Many modern web applications expose REST interfaces, where the API allows you to access specific data objects. Okay. Last time I gave an example of a Google Maps API. Okay. Google Maps is an example of a RESTful API, because you can actually access or request a specific map. That is the resource you are accessing. The API allows you to access maps of different locations. Okay. So, HTTP is a popular way to implement RESTful services, but that need not be the only protocol, that just happens to be a common one. Okay. Lots of RESTful services actually use or run over the web or over HTTP. Many uh, uh, HTTP APIs that modern web services expose also use this architecture. Okay. And you will encounter this when you do your lab, because you will be expected to write a RESTful application, just so that you get some idea of how this is done. Okay. But at a very high level, all services, if they use HTTP, are going to essentially use HTTP. Okay. You can get a resource using the get method, you can put, meaning you can post to that resource, and you can do certain other operations, but those are the, the four operations that you can do, of which get and post or put are the more common ones. Okay. Uh, the important part is your API or the URL that you use to access this service is fully descriptive. It has all the information needed for the service to actually perform that operation. Okay, basically, the resource you are trying to access and all the parameters that are needed in order to perform the operation are all specified in the API or in the, in the URL in this case, because HTTP. Okay. And here is an example of a HTTP API. In this case, you are as accessing 
on a cloud service it happens to be Amazon, essentially a data object. So you essentially have HTTP bucket name, so that's the URL, that's the name of the data object and you can either do get which means you'll get the object, you can do put, you can delete or you can post. Okay, those are the four HTTP operations that you can perform on this object. Okay, very simple example, we'll come back to more detail, just question that. Okay, so the question is, the one thing I haven't yet mentioned is lot of the RESTful, not lot, typically a RESTful web service also ends up being stateless. It doesn't keep state of the request. All the information you need to process a request is in the URL that you send. Okay, so you don't need to keep state. The next request you make has to again specify all the information you need. Okay, and there's a question about authentication here, which says have, if you have authenticated to a RESTful web service, is it going to keep state? that you are actually authenticated to the web server, is that state, does that make it stateful? That's your question, correct? Yeah. So that depends on how you write the RESTful web services. Authentication is orthogonal to actually using the service itself. Okay? There may be services where once you authenticate, you might get a token that you have to present every time. That's your odd token. Okay? In this case, there is no state kept. You essentially use the odd token to authenticate yourself over and over again. Every request has to include it, otherwise you will be denied. Okay. There will be other scenarios where they might actually make a session where you are authenticated. In that case, you do not need to provide this authentication. But authentication and security is orthogonal to the essential service you are providing. Okay. But you can also do authentication in a stateless manner should you want to. Okay. So, in this case, what is going to happen is the, the response that you get from the service usually comes as a JSON object. Okay. And there is an example of that object that is shown there. Uh, but that's not required, you can send the object back, the requested object in any format. JSON just happens to be the way web services do it. Okay? Yes, question here. Is it in some of the cases, the state might be different? Like most of the cases, state is not going to state. Right. So typically, RESTful web services is going to have impl implement stateless execution. I just gave one example where if you are uh, implementing security, which is not what is central to the service that just says that only certain users are allowed to access it, you might keep state saying you have authenticated, but that is not state for the service itself. Okay, the service is typically going to be stateless. Okay, do people know what stateless means? Stateless essentially means you do not keep any information about the client that is making the request. Okay, every time the client has to provide all the information the service needs to process the request. Okay? Okay. So, the last point I want to mention which I will not go into too much detail is there is another architecture which I did not mention, but it is very popular in industry. Okay. It is called a service oriented architecture or SOA. Okay. In the uh, 10 years ago, this was really the most popular architecture. Okay. And what we have talked here about here are resource oriented architectures or ROAs. Okay. Question is what is the difference between SOA architecture and ROA architecture? Okay. The main thing is how you are actually trying to implement your distributed application. Okay. In service oriented architectures, you think of your application as a set of compute components, okay. processing components. Okay. Those are the services, the pro process requests. Okay. So, you basically say I have these modules, each module provides a service, it is going to provide some computational capability and I split my application into service 1, service 2, service 3 and they all communicate with one another to implement the full application. Okay. So, you think of services or computational elements when you think of service oriented architecture. When you think of resource oriented architecture, you think of data, not the computation you are performing on it. Okay. So, you access a map object, you do not say what operation you are going to perform on it, for example. Okay. So, if you think of an application as consisting of a set of resources and your application is written by accessing those resources and performing operations on those resources, then you essentially have a resource oriented architect. Okay. Now, you might think of a service as a resource in which case there is no distinction between the two, okay. but that is really the, the main difference between what used to be service oriented architectures, but now you write them in and think of applications as having resources that you access as opposed to services that you access. Okay. Yes, question. Okay, question is if you access a cluster, 
Is it providing a service-oriented architecture? So this is actually talking about a distributed application that you write. Okay? It's not talking about logging into a machine and doing something. Okay? Yes, clusters also provide services. But in this case, it's not providing a service-oriented architecture with application. We are talking about an application, which could be a client-server application or a web-based application, okay, as an example. Yes, question in the back. Okay, that's a good question. Is transition from SOA to ROA provide any advantages? This is the current fad. That was the old fad. But having said that, um, there are advantages in the sense of ROI architectures are stateless. SOA architectures don't need to be stateless. They can be stateful. And there are some high level differences between writing an application in a stateless fashion and a stateful fashion. Okay? Uh, beyond that, you can write your application using any of these architectures. It really doesn't matter. Having said that, if you want to use HTTP as a way for your application components to communicate, this is a better architecture. So architecture uses a different protocol, typically something called SOAP. It's an XML based protocol. We'll get to SOAP as well. Okay. Uh, ROA architectures just use HTTP requests. Okay. So if HTTP is more interoperable with lots of things, this is a better approach with how, how clients work today. Okay. Beyond that, there is no, not a whole lot of difference. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So we are done with module one. Just another reminder, don't use phones or laptops in classes. I just have to remind periodically because people forget. Okay, That's just a reminder. And here is another uh, announcement. There's going to be a career fair. I don't know if you, all of you know this. Uh, Computer Science and Engineering has a career fair on Feb 12th, okay. the campus center. So if you're interested in internships, jobs, and whatnot, please go. I've been asked to make announcement in the class, so I'm making that announcement just to let all of you know. Okay? And pr presumably, uh, things that you learn here will be useful to you when you apply for jobs or interviews and things like that. Okay? All right. So with that, let's get on with uh, this thing, go to module two. So now we'll talk about client-server architecture. We've done a broad brush introduction to all kinds of architectures to write your applications. Now we are going to focus on one. Okay, which is the client server model. Okay. So this is a very common architecture. In this case, our application is split into two pieces, a client piece and a server piece. Okay. The server piece does all the work. The client piece requests work from the server. Okay. So servers, so now when you say server, the server is not just a machine. It's actually the piece of code that runs on the machine. That's something you want to keep in mind. Because when you say server, sometimes you might think I'm talking about a piece of hardware. So I'm not necessarily mentioning the hardware here. By server, we actually mean a piece of software that provides a service. Okay? And similarly, client is not just the, a machine. It's actually a piece of code that's requesting, uh, making requests to the server. Okay? Now, the client server architecture, as that picture shows, uses a request response or a request reply model. Okay? Clients make requests to servers. Requests go over a network, arrive at the server. The server is going to provide a service, which means it will process that request. Okay? And in doing so, it provides a service and send back a reply. Okay? While that request is being processed, okay, the client is going to wait for the reply, typically. Okay? So this is also a timeline. Okay? The dark line says you are actually executing. Dotted line means you are waiting. So initially, the server is waiting for request. Request comes from the client. Server starts executing. It provides a service, processes the request, sends back a reply, and the service uh, client continues. Okay? All client-server systems will use this model. Not all, but I shouldn't say all. Most of them, okay? if they use what is called a synchronous model. Okay? Now, you might know this because that's how web works. So your client, in that case, is a web browser. The server, in that case, is a web server. The requests you make are essentially clicking on links or just accessing a web page. Okay? Very simple architecture. Okay? But now, what we would like to do is to understand how you are going to implement an application using the client-server model. Okay? A distributed application will actually have three components. Okay? A user interface component, okay? a processing layer, okay? and the data layer. Okay? And we'll see how to structure these components across the client and the server. Which of those pieces will be at the client? Which of those pieces will be at the server? 
okay, and what does that give us in terms of our distributed application. Okay, so, let us first take an example which is in this case a search engine. Okay, you does not really need, you do not need to know what search engines do internally, but this is an example to show you how to build this three layered application. Okay. So, at the very top the box shows your user interface layer. Okay. That is the interface the search engine is going to expose to the users. Okay. In case of Google that is a simple search box in a browser, that is your interface, that is all you are going to see. Okay. So, now you might actually type something in the search box and uh, send it off to the server and then what happens. Okay. So, in this case a set of keywords are sent off to the server. Okay. So, when you actually have the dotted line, you are making a transition from the user interface level to the processing tier. Okay. In this case the processing tier is at the server, okay. the user interface tier is at the client or in the browser. Okay. So, so, that top dotted line is also the distinction between what is at the client and what is at the server for this example. Okay. So, the keywords come to the server, there is a query generator that is going to take the keywords and make a database query. Okay. Presumably, you have a database where you indexed a bunch of web pages okay, and stored them in the database. So, the database query is going to go access the web pages that are going to match that query okay. and then they are going to essentially be sent off to a ranking algorithm which is going to say here is the most relevant pages. You are going to rank your results in order of relevance based on what you the search engine thinks the user is requesting. Okay. So, you take the ranking algorithm then you make an HTML page out of it okay. and that HTML page comes back to the browser or the user interface in this case and you see those results. Okay. A simple example there is a lot more happening in a real search engine, but this toy example suffices for us because you see at the top you have a user interface layer. The middle one which is in this case the query generator, the HTML generator, the ranking algorithm, those all collectively implement our processing tier. Okay. And your database at the bottom is essentially a data layer. Okay. So, the, the indexing engine is not shown, the crawlers are not shown and what not. Okay. So, all that is not shown, but that does not matter. Okay. What is important is that we have these three layers that form part of this distributed application. Okay. Is this clear? Okay. So, this just shows you that these applications are going to have these three tiers okay. and so this gives us what is called a multi-tiered architecture. Okay. Your application is split into a set of tiers, each tier is essentially going to uh, work with other tiers to process the entire uh, request that is actually come from the client. Okay. Typically, the clients are going to implement the user interface tier, not always typically and the server might implement the processing and the data tier, but we will see that is not a strict requirement, we will see a spectrum of choices in just a moment. Okay. So, so, here are some examples of different ways you could build your application. Okay. So, what is shown here essentially are our three layers, the user interface application and the database layer. Okay, and then you see that there is a dotted line that shows the split. Okay. Anything above is actually running on the client machine. Okay. Anything below is running on the server. Okay. And it just shows us there is a spectrum of choices you can make. Okay. In this application, the user interface is split between the client and the server. The processing layer and the data layer are all at the server. Okay. In this case, the user interface is completely at the client the processing layer and the data layer are completely at the server. Okay. Here you see that the user interface and part of the application actually sits on the client, okay. part of the application sits on the server, the data layer is completely at the server and so on. So, you will see that progression. Okay. So, you have a choice okay, of what you are going to put at the client, what you are going to put at the server and we will see some examples of actual scenarios where you see these choices in practice. Yes, question. Okay. The question is what is an example of E where the database is split? Give me one minute, we are going to start from A and then go to E. Okay. So, what is an example of A where you have the user interface being split between the client and the server? Yes. Okay. Good, good one, JavaScript enabled website. So, this is a browser based application. Okay. You have some processing and user interface actually sitting on the browser. Okay. You have essentially have more processing happening 
on the server side interface level okay and then the application and what not actually is on the server so you can think of webmail gmail is a good example part of the user interface processing when you click on something actually has to go to the server and things have to happen there okay this question can spire be an example that's a web based application yes okay any any javascript based application will actually qualify okay here is b okay user interface is completely there okay and the application and the database is also here so some web browsers might actually use that kind of scenario there may be little user interface processing a web form is a simple example where you are essentially going to do only very limited amount of user interface okay everything else actually happens on the server okay okay some examples of c anyone yes Okay, privacy preserving machine learning okay why would it be split this way okay some part of it is going to run on the phone because you don't want it on the server there was another hand so i will come back to the phone thing you mentioned yes somebody else had something to say okay yes Okay, online games. Okay, well, so that's fine. What about phone-based application? So pretty much all smartphone applications will have your user interface on the on the phone. Okay, part of the application is written into the app, right? And then when the app communicates with the server, there has to be a server component, so it's a networked app. Okay, you basically have to have the rest of the app implemented on the server, and any database that you might have will also reside on the server. Okay, games are another example. Okay, you mentioned phone-based. Okay, privacy-preserving ML, although that's not really a topic for this course. Part of that is true. You might do some learning on the phone. You don't send all of the data off to the server. Okay, for those of you who know what ML is and what privacy-preserving ML. Okay, so all these are good examples. Okay, yes, question. Why is Gmail an example of A? So when you do JavaScript processing, some of the processing actually has to happen on the browser. Some of it actually has to happen based on what you click. Some things have to go to the server. Okay, so a little bit of the interface is actually there because the JavaScript is coming to you from the server. Okay, so we basically assume that the interface is split between the client and the server in this case. Okay, so these are richer web applications where you essentially have some split between the client and the server. Okay, yes, question. Okay, the question is, do you basically assume that on the client side, the client access, user accessing it and the server side is the server doing something and the administrator doing something. So here we don't have an administrator in the picture, just to be clear. Okay, there's a user, the user sits at the client, the server provides a service. Having said that, everything else you said is true, where the user is accessing the user interface and then there is some processing of that user interface or user uh, whatever the user is trying to do, some of that is being processed in the server. Okay. Now, as far as D and E are concerned, think of them as uh, what we would call desktop-based application with maybe a server component. There's a lot more code that you implement in the application, okay. and then essentially your user interface and application is completely at the desktop, okay. and then all of that application is doing is accessing a database sitting somewhere on the server. So you are just basically have a application with a nice user interface. When you type something, it's just making queries of a remote database, fetching data and showing you those results. Okay? Even smartphone apps might do that. I shouldn't say that, just desktop apps. It's just any app where the entire application sits on the client side and all that the application is doing is querying a remote database. Okay? That's an example of D. And in E, you are improving the performance of accessing this remote data by essentially caching or keeping some part of the data locally. So that's why your database is split, because there is a performance penalty of accessing data over a network. So you might keep some frequently accessed data either in a cache or also in some local data files. Okay? 
Okay, that just improves performance. So that's an example of E. So we've gone from all the way from A to E. All this to tell you is any application you think of can be built in any of these ways. And the answer to which one you should pick is going to depend on what are you going to do, how much resources does the client have, how much should you put burden you put on the server, where should the data reside. So there's no going, not going to be any one answer. Okay? So you can decide how you're going to split all of these things between the client and the server. Yes, Jacob. Uh, the, the example for which one? No, the example for B. Okay. So B basically says as a user interface is completely at the uh, client and the application and the database is here. So think of this as a very simple web-based form or things like that where you just simply provide some data and all the processing and the data access actually happens there. Yes? Any other questions? Yes. Yes, if you think of a simple Google search box, that would be B because the interface is very simple. There's just a web form. And then all the processing is actually happening later. But if you put JavaScript in there, that doesn't quite hold. But yes, in principle, yes. Question. My, my query is related to the second part. Yes. Uh, how it offers you suggestions for why Yes. So if you actually have. When you do autocomplete, we're typing a query and it's showing you autocomplete, there's some interface processing happening here. Okay, this is why I said if you have JavaScript and modern web search, that's not even going to be B, it's going to be A. Okay, but if you think of something very simple where you just type or something and it goes to the server, that's an example of B. Okay? So let's move on. So here is an example of how those three tiers are actually going to interact with one another. So you will see, essentially, x-axis here is time. Okay? Now you will see why the layered approach now becomes relevant. Each of these layers is actually only talking to the layer above and below it. In this case, there are only three. Okay? There's the user interface, the application server, and the database server. But modern web applications actually take that application component or the processing layer and also split that into multiple tiers just so that if you have microservices architecture and things like that, your application tier is not one piece, it's multiple pieces. Okay? But so you can have n layers, but here we only show three. Okay? But be that as it may, you'll see that you essentially make a request. The request comes from tier one to tier two, which is the application server or the app server is going to do some processing. In doing so, it might go access some uh, data from a database and then the results come back. You essentially then process it, make an HTML page, send it back. Okay? Many web applications, not many, this is a very common architecture for building web applications. Okay? Your online stores, they use this model. Many of these web applications that you access on a day-to-day -day basis use this model. With one important consideration, which is that application server that is shown as one piece might actually be many different pieces okay? that has a similar tiering in it. Okay, but very simple ones, you can just build that as a single piece. Okay? So a typical tiering is there's HTTP server that's doing web processing. Okay, there's a client, which is the web browser. Okay, on the server side, you might have an HTTP server that's receiving web requests. Then you might have a PHP server or Python, Django, or uh, things like that, or a Java enterprise server that's actually implementing the code for the application. Okay. That's your pro application server, and then you have a backend database okay, where all the data is stored. Okay, so you might use these kinds of components to build a web application. Okay, that's just one example. There are many such examples. Okay. So that's client-server model, and of course we are going to come back to all of this because this is just architectural discussion. It's not a discussion on how to build multi-tier applications. Okay. So you just need to know what are multi-tier applications. We'll come back to how to build those in a, in a later class. Okay? Now, the last thing I want to mention here is uh, what is called an edge server model or what is called a client proxy server model. We talked about a client server model where clients make requests of servers. Okay? This can be generalized and you can introduce a new component between the client and the server which is called a proxy or a proxy server. Okay? In this case, clients are going to make requests that go to a proxy server first. The proxy server will see if it can process that request on behalf of the actual server, which is why it's called a proxy. Okay? 
If it can service that request, it is going to send back the response immediately. If it cannot service that request, it will then forward that request to the actual server, which will then process it and send back a reply. Okay. In normal client server architecture, there is no proxy, you are just talking directly to the server. Okay. In this model, you actually put a second server, which we will call a proxy server, that is pretending to provide the same service as the actual server. Okay. But it may not be able to do everything that the actual server does. Okay. An example of a proxy server is to simply put a cache, it is now called a proxy cache. That is a very dumb server, it does not really provide a service other than just pro caching some web pages. So, in this case, your browser request will first go hit the proxy cache. If the web page you are accessing is already in the cache, you are going to get a reply immediately. Okay, and the assumption generally is that the proxy is closer to the client than the actual server. So, the latency to go to the proxy is going to be lower than going to the actual server. Okay, if there is no other advantage, then why would you do it in the first place? Right? So, that is the reason you are going to put uh, in this case, it is a cache, but there are many kinds of proxy services you can provide. Okay. Caching is the simplest kinds of proxy service. Okay. So, this generalizes our client server architecture to a client proxy server architecture. Okay. When we come in to the lecture where we will talk about the world wide web, we will look at this in quite some detail, okay. but until then we are not going to worry about proxies at all. We will only think about clients and servers, but not proxy servers. Okay. Now, let me just quickly mention what is shown in the picture here. So, it looks a little confusing, but it is taken from the book. So, there are clients there, okay, which are at the top. Okay. These clients normally talk to this actual server shown here, that is your client server architecture. In this model, what has happened is you have put these what are called edge servers or proxy servers that are simple caches that are presumably closer to this client. Okay, this picture actually is misleading, it does not look any closer than the server, but you can believe that this server might be sitting closer to this uh, client here. So, in this case, client requests first go to the proxy okay, and then if the proxy cannot handle it, they get forwarded to the actual server. Okay. And there are many systems that implement this form of web caching and one uh, example of this is what are called content delivery networks or CDNs. Okay. These are basically a global network of proxy caches that provide just web caching as a service in addition to other services. Okay, this is often used for video streaming. Okay. You have video content close to you, so as soon as you hit play, it starts playing. If you have to get that content from a far off server, there may be latencies involved and other problems. Okay. Again, we will come back to this at a later time, just some things to keep in mind. Any questions on this? Okay. So, we are done with module 2, client server architecture is done. Now, we are going to talk about peer to peer, okay. decentralized architecture. Okay. So, in a peer to peer architecture, we are going to remove the distinction between the client and the server. Okay. In a client server architecture, there is an implicit assumption that the server is the more important part of the application. It is providing the service after all. So, in a decentralized architecture, there is no server, there are only peers, they are all equal. Okay. Peers can make request of other peers. In that case, the first peer would be a client, act as a client, the second peer would act as a server or peers can also provide services to other peers. So, you can be a client for when you make requests or you can be a server when other, others make request of you. Okay. So, this is a very diff different way of thinking about how to write our applications. All nodes, all machines are peers, they can all provide services, they can all make requests for services from other peers. Okay. And you can use this for variety of applications, uh, we will talk about several. Many of them are oriented around storage, where peers actually store content and you are requesting content. Okay. So, what is shown in this picture is in one example of a decentralized or a P to P architecture. Okay. This is also called a structured peer to peer system, because in this case the architecture actually of the system looks like a ring. Okay. The topology of the nodes actually looks like a ring, it is not looks, it is a logical ring. Okay. So, so, the what this application is trying to provide is a service called a distributed hash table or a DHT. Okay. I presume all of you know what a hash table is. Okay. In a hash table, you basically provide a key okay, and you will do a lookup in the hash table, it is going to hash it to a value and say for this key, this is the value and give you a value. Okay. 
So th that example of a hash table is centralized where the entire hash table is stored in the memory of one machine. In a distributed hash table, your hash table is very large. You can no longer store it on one machine. So you are going to split your hash table across multiple machines. So think of a very large table. Okay, it doesn't fit in the memory of any one machine. So you are going to split it into n pieces. Okay, first piece goes on machine one, second piece goes on machine two, third piece goes on machine three, and so on. So now you have distributed your hash table across multiple machines. Okay, but you still want to provide a hashing service where if a user comes and says, here is the key, you want to somehow look up this distributed hash table and say, here is the value. Okay? This, this is what a DHT would do. Okay? Somehow the system has to figure out where the keys are stored. So you actually go look up the right key on the right machine and get the value that the user is looking for. Okay? Now this system, which is called CORD, okay, uses a ring topology to achieve that goal. Okay? So what is shown essentially, the circles that are shown are essentially keys in the system. Those are the values or the rows of your hash tables that are numbered 0 to 15. There are 16 keys in this system. Okay? The dark circles, you will see that some circles are dotted and some circles are dark. The dark circles are actually nodes or machines in the system. Those are the peers. Okay? And what is shown is that when a node becomes part of the system, it picks an ID which is equal to one of the keys in the system. Okay? This node has picked ID 7 for itself. Okay? So what that does is essentially it takes your hash table and it splits it. So essentially when this node says my ID is 7, it has taken responsibility for all the keys that essentially go from the previous node to itself. Okay? So you will see that keys 5, 6 and 7 are actually stored on machine 7. Okay? Node 4 essentially has responsibility for storing keys 3, 2, 3 and 4 from the hash table. Node 1 essentially stores key 0 and 1 and so on. So this is just a random way of splitting your hash table across multiple nodes. Whenever a node becomes part of the system, it randomly picks a key okay? and then essentially it talks to the previous node and says all the keys from that node to itself essentially now are stored on this node. Okay? So randomized way of just splitting the hash table. You could have said take there are n nodes there are k keys divided k over n. That would be another way to split it. That's a more deterministic way to split it. This is a randomized process to split the hash table across nodes in the system. Okay? So now, having done this, you will see that each node has some part of the hash table with it. So when you say go look up key number 7, okay, somehow you will basically inject that request somewhere in the system. Okay? Maybe node 1 gets this request and go look up no key number 7 okay, and find the value of that key. Okay? Now the system has to do what is called request routing. It has to go figure out which node actually has this key so it can do the actual lookup. Okay? This is called request routing okay? which is not shown in this picture. But as part of that chord system, there is a request routing protocol where you are essentially going to send this request, it will hop from node to node until it gets to the node that essentially has the key, then you do the lookup. Then you essentially says, what is the value of 7 because that is what I am going to look up. You get a value and that is what you give, that is the hash lookup, right? So then you give that re reply or, uh, or uh, give that value as a reply to the client. Right? So what is not shown here is the request routing protocol, but you do not really need to worry about it. You could do, come up with any protocol of your own which says, let me just do a brute force search. I am going to ask node 1, do you have it? If not, send it off to your neighbor. So 1 will send it to 4 saying, do you have 7? 4 will say, no, I do not. It will send it to the next node. It will arrive at 7. And then you will say, okay, now you actually found a node that is responsible for key number 7 and you do the lookup. Okay, that is a linear search. Of course, that is a search process. You can find many more efficient ways to do it. Okay. The card paper actually tells you how this is done, which I am not going to go into here. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So this is an example of a P2P system because these are peers. The service they are providing is a lookup service, a hash table lookup service. Okay. And there is no one server in the system. It is completely decentralized. Okay. No sub machine is any more important than any other machine. Okay. Yes, question. Okay, question is what is the value stored? Okay, so this is a hash table. Anything you could use a hash table for, you can use this system. Okay, so 
in early p2p you are you are essentially storing content or files okay you want to look up a certain file okay you say i want food dot image okay so the values are actually files okay but value could be anything you could store whatever you want is essentially is a hash table service okay what is stored in the hash table is orthogonal you can use it it's like saying i have a database and you are asking what do you what do i store in the database whatever you want right the same thing it's a hash table you can use it to store whatever content you want in it okay yes question that okay so question is when you say peer to peer is it ad hoc in the sense of nodes come and go is what do you mean by ad hoc network yes okay so i'm going to talk a little bit about that so uh, in most peer to peer systems they are designed in a way to ensure high reliability because peers might not be as reliable as server nodes Okay, they might crash they might come and go there it may be a participatory network where you are volunteering resources you can't guarantee that a peer is always going to stick around okay so all of these systems are built under the assumptions that nodes can join or leave at any time this is why this randomized process works if a new node joins it picks a id that's not used it joins and then the hash table splits again if node 7 decides to leave for any reason or crashes okay there is a protocol that will tell other peers saying your neighbor has disappeared and then you have to take over responsibility for serving those keys okay which means that you want to ensure that there isn't only one copy of anything because that node goes then the data is gone okay you have to multiple copies all of that is not shown here but dynamics are part and parcel of all peer to peer system because unlike a client server architecture the server is assumed to be stable it's generally up you don't assume it will just disappear for no reason in this case we assume that peers might go away okay or that's how systems are built or that under that assumption so there's more dynamics so there's a quite a bit of work that you have to do to ensure that there can be joins and leaves and all of that kind of stuff which is never an issue when you when you have a client server architecture you don't have servers randomly joining saying i'm going to provide a service of any sort okay that's the, but this is what happens in these kind of systems okay so now let me talk about another such peer to peer system this is called a content addressable network or can okay. this is a straight forward generalization of cord okay in cord essentially you had one key that you did a look up on you got a value okay so it's a single dimensional look up there's just a key space that goes from 0 through n okay you look up a key you get a value okay in cord you essentially have two keys or two attributes you can look up Okay, so you provide key one and key two, and then you basically get a value. Okay, so you might say, why do you need two-dimensional lookup? Why is one not enough? Okay, so think of you are looking up content. So you might have a file name and a file type. Those are two attributes. I want a file with the name foo, and I want it to be a JPEG image, or I want it to be a PDF file. Okay, those are two attributes. There may be many files with the name foo. One may be a PDF file, one may be an image file, one may be some other kind of file. So now you are specifying two attributes. Okay, so your key, uh, key essentially is split into two parts. Okay, there are key uh, K1 and K2, and you are going to look up a value. Okay, so essentially your key space has now become two-dimensional, not one-dimensional. So rather than keys going from zero through n. you have an x axis for a key and a y axis for a key so in this picture you should essentially show a normalized value of keys going from 0 to 1 on the x axis and keys going from 0 to 1 on the y axis so any coordinate in this two dimensional space represents a specific key okay and then you look up that key and find a value okay is that clear what 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 this is trying to do okay i haven't said how it works but i'm just trying to under, explain what this two dimensional look up so essentially this is still a hash table that has two attributes that you have to specify there are two keys and then you look up a value okay so this is no more expressive than a cord system in a cord system you could have simply taken those two keys and concatenated them and it becomes one key and you can still do that look up okay you could have said foo dot pdf for example okay this is just allowing you to uh, dimensions so is essentially doing the same thing but it's a two dimensional system Okay. Now you have the same kind of scenarios you want to think of. Okay, so, so the actual dots here are peers that are part of the system. 
So when a peer joins the system, it picks a random x, y coordinate for itself that is not yet taken. Okay? And that is basically where it is going to sit. Okay? So essentially these rectangles that you see are, are essentially the key space that the dot at the center, the peer at the center is responsible for. Okay? So this peer here that is labeled 0 0.7, 0 0.2 is responsible for answering all queries that essentially span from this point in the key space to that point on the x axis and this point in the y axis. So that bounding box is basically saying all the keys that fall in that area are your responsibility. If any request comes, you are going to have to figure out what the value is. Okay? So essentially when you are going to join this network, you are going to pick a coordinate and that coordinate causes the, each of the rectangles that are formed to split further. So let us say you have a new node joining as you will see here. Okay, this in the second picture, a new node joined and that caused this bigger rectangle to split into two smaller rectangles. Okay, so essentially nodes adjust themselves and now you have two rectangles and there are two peers, each of them split the job of the previous peer. Okay. Similarly, if a peer leaves, you have to take its key space and somehow merge it with some other nodes. Okay. And unlike the chord system, where if a peer leaves, the next node in the ring simply takes over all of that responsibility. Here is not that simple because you can't merge a rectangle arbitrarily. For example, if this peer points and point to leaves, okay, that rectangle cannot be split or merged with any other rectangle. Okay. So you will actually have to split it, cut it into two and maybe take that part and merge it with this one and this part and merge it with this. So you have to do some extra work to figure out how to take the key space and split it into two and then merge it with an existing peer. But that is beyond that detail, it is the same thing as what a chord does, which is nodes join, the key space split, the DHT splits, nodes leave, you take the responsibility of that leaving peer and merge it with an existing peer. Okay. Request routing is very similar. Okay, you are going to essentially inject a query on any, into any peer. That query has to hop from node to node until it finds the peer that holds the, that basically is in the right bounding box and then you are going to have that peer answer your query. Yeah, yes, question. Okay, so question is, does this require full replication of every content on every peer? Okay. The answer is no, because that assumes that all nodes are going to leave at the same time. Okay. There is some assumption on what kind of dynamics you can expect. So if you assume one over k fraction of the nodes can leave at any time, then you can only, you do have to replicate much less than if all nodes leave. Okay. So let us say that every node's content is replicated on three other nodes chosen at random. Okay. So then, so long as not all four of those nodes leave at the same time, if any three of them leaves, the content is still available, for example. Right? So the replication is much smarter than I replicate everything everywhere, then you may just end up with a centralized system, why bother? Right? Any other questions here? Okay. So these two, uh, this is called content addressable network or CAN, this can be extended into D dimensions. Okay? I just spoke about two, but you can think of a three dimensional CAN system where this the key space is a cube, okay? geometric cube. Essentially, there are three attributes for every key, okay? K1, K2, K3 and so on and so forth. You can make it arbitrary. Okay? So, uh, that is the way to think about this. All right. So, now we are going to talk about unstructured peer to peer system very briefly. I am not going to go into details here. Okay, so, structured peer to peer systems as you see have a structure where there is either a two dimensional space or there is a ring topology and peers essentially are part of that topology. Okay. In an unstructured peer to peer system, the network topology grows organically. There is no predetermined topology that says if there are n peers, that is the architecture that they are going to form or that is the type of network they are going to form. The network essentially forms in an arbitrary fashion. Okay. So, let us say there is one peer, uh, there are two peers in the system, okay. third peer joins, it is going to form links with two other peers. Another peer joins, it might pick some random peers and say, I have this as node as my neighbor and that node as my neighbor. Okay. Yet another peer joins, it will pick two random peers and form links with it and so on and so forth. Okay. So, you will see that the topology that is being formed looks nothing like a ring or a 
or a two dimensional thing, it is just going to grow organically and randomly based on which peers join, who those peers pick as their neighbors and what topology results as, uh, as a result of those choices. Okay? So, now there are many peer to peer systems that began this way. Okay? Rather than saying when I join, I pick a uh, ID for myself and I join that specific location in the ring, you say pick a random ID, pick some random neighbors, be part of the network and that is it. Okay? So, there is no structure to this network, it is completely unstructured. Okay? What that means is when you search for, this still provides us an equivalent of a hash table like key value lookup service, okay? except that lookups are lot more complicated because there is no structure to the network. What is stored where, you do not know a priori. Okay? So, if you say go look up this key and you essentially send this node saying go look up key k and it comes to this node, all this node is going to have to do is a brute force flood saying I am going to ask all nodes and whoever has it will reply and then I am going to send back that reply to my uh, client that made this request. Okay? So, this is essentially called flooding where this node will say I will look up locally, do I have k? Okay, if so, I found it, if not, I am going to send it to my two neighbors. So, I actually in this case, there are three neighbors. So, I am going to send it to all my neighbors. So, you will send lookup k to these three nodes. These three nodes will look it up and then they will forward it to their neighbors okay? and so on and so forth until it essentially floods the network. You will see that there are lots of repetitive messages that are going to get exchanged in this case. Okay? Every query essentially becomes order n square queries depending on what the structure of the network is. Okay? This is called flooding okay? because essentially you are asking every node by uh, having every node forward that request to all of its neighbors. So, eventually it propagates through the entire network okay? and replies come back the opposite way. Okay? Every node replies to the one that made the request and then the replies get collated until you find uh, all the responses and send it off to the client. Okay? Very different type of uh, uh, lookup as opposed to a DST based lookup which is very structured okay? because you have a ring topology or your, your two dimensional topology. So, your request routing is much more efficient than a flooding based routing. This is basically routing by flooding. You ask everyone because I do not know who has what. Okay? Is that clear? So, early forms of P2P network use that topology. Okay, there are things like Nutella and lots of other early uh, P2P networks, but then later forms of networks essentially started using more structured topologies because request routing was more efficient. You could exchange far fewer messages and still find the object or the key you are looking for than flooding the network every time. Okay. All right, so, I am going to skip this slide, but we will go to super peers. Okay. Because uh, unstructured networks essentially use the form of flooding, okay. uh, P2P uh, system designers said how do we reduce the network overhead of flooded requests. Okay. So, the, they came up with this notion of a super peer where every group of peers in a neighborhood essentially elects one of their nodes as a super peer. Okay. That super peer is responsible for answering all requests on behalf of all the peers. So, essentially it knows what its uh, peers in its cluster are storing and it can reply to queries. Okay? When you are actually doing the actual lookup, you have to go to the peer, but if you are just asking who has this object, you, you know because you know what is in your neighbor. Okay? So, what is shown in this case are essentially four clusters from your P2, unstructured P2P network. Each cluster has four or five nodes and the dark nodes are the super peers that have been elected by the peers in that group and those are the ones that are responsible for answering queries. Okay? So, what this has essentially done is it has reduced the number of nodes that are involved in answering a query because you are still flooding the network, but the queries are only flooding to the super peers, not to every peer. Okay? So, the number of messages that get exchanged is lower okay? and presumably super peers are the more powerful peers in each group. They have better network connectivity, maybe more CPU, more memory, what have you. Okay. So, this architecture essentially allowed unstructured networks to reduce the cost of answering queries and it also reduced the inter number of interactions that have to go. The content is still stored at the peers. Okay. 
what a super peer has is just information of what it peers do. So if you say who has key k, a super peer will know if its cluster has that key or not has that key and which node has it. For the actual lookup, you still have to go to that peer. Okay, so that's something you want to keep in mind. Okay. Now a good example of super peers, early go example was Skype. Okay. Skype started as a peer-to-peer -peer application. Okay, there was no centralized server, not anymore. Okay, this is the old days of Skype. Okay, essentially, every network, every node essentially was a peer. If you wanted to call a friend, you essentially had to figure out where which IP address that friend was logged in, whether they're logged in, and then you route your request over the network, find them, and then make a direct connection and talk to them. <coughs> So who is logged into the network, what IP address they are logged in, all of that was essentially stored in a distributed hash table. All of the nodes participated. Okay, so essentially uh, you have to be part of the network and do this. But what that did is if every node was a peer and I had to ask, are you user X? Okay, and uh, so if I have to answer that question every time somebody is looking for their friend to call, that's a lot of overhead. Okay, so essentially Skype went to a super peer model where it tracked who are the users and what, how are they logged in in that cluster. So you could answer is this person logged in, what IP address are they logged in from and so on. Okay. Now those days are long gone of Skype using a peer-to-peer -peer network. Now they have gone back to a client server architecture where all of this is centralized or not really centralized but is stored on poor powerful servers and that is where your Skype client is going to con contact. Okay. But there were, there was a time where you would suddenly see that your machine is idle, okay, you are running Skype and there is a lot of traffic coming to your network because suddenly your cl Skype client was elected as a super peer and it had to take the burden of answering all these queries from random other super, uh, Skype uh, uh, clients from all over the world. Okay. So this used to happen at one point but now all of that is gone because that causes inconvenience to users. So modern Skype does not use this but this was early days of Skype. Okay, they came up with this idea of super peers. Any question? Yes. So this okay. So what are good examples? I'm going to talk about BitTorrent next. Okay, which is still a very popular way of downloading large files. Okay, that uses a P2P model. Okay, there are many many others, but whenever the application becomes really important, you don't rely on peers because lot of this assumes that users are donating their resources to the network. The peers are essentially contributing their resources and then they work together. Okay. Another example in addition to uh, uh, BitTorrent is P2P backup. There are many services that allow you to backup your files to your friend's machine, your friend's files is backed up to your machine, all encrypted so you can't read each other's files, but you don't really need to backup to a central server. Okay, so that's another example that's still used in some backup applications. Okay, yes, question. Is the connection between the nodes static or dynamic? Are you asking about the links? Okay, so the connection between nodes has to be dynamic by definition because in any P2P network you cannot assume that your neighbors to which you are connected to will stay up, they might disappear then the links have to be re-established. You might make new connections to new neighbors. So the topology keeps changing. Okay, so the, all the links are dynamic, essentially. Are there questions here? Okay. okay, so last thing is we are going to talk about BitTorrent. Okay, BitTorrent is also an example of a peer-to-peer -peer system. Okay, it is used to download large files, large content. Okay, and the way it works is it takes a very large piece of fire content, splits it into smaller chunks. Okay, think of a large movie, for example, or a large DVD software distribution. New, distrib new uh, release of Linux comes out. Okay, it's a large DVD. You split it up into smaller chunks. The chunks are stored across peers. Okay, so you basically partition the chunks across n peers. You might even replicate the chunks. So now if I want to download this file, I am going to essentially download each chunk from all, each peer that stores it and then piece together the file at the client. Okay. So one thing this does is it allows me to do parallel downloads. 
I don't have to wait and sequentially download that file because it's going to take a long time. I can make n connections to n peers, download n chunks in parallel, then I'd get the next n chunks and so on. So presumably that's going to speed up the download. Instead of making one connection to one peer and downloading a large file very slowly, right, I have n connections that are going to do this in parallel for me. Okay. So one of the things that BitTorrent did is essentially allowed you to do parallel file downloads by taking a large file, splitting it into chunks, spreading the chunks across peers, so each peer can make a connection to n other peers and start downloading those chunks. Okay. That's the first thing it did. Okay. The second thing that BitTorrent did is essentially it enforced what is called altruism. Okay. Because in a P2P system, the system as a whole works well if users not only download from others, but also provide services to other peers. If you just download files and say, I'm done, I'm going to shut this uh, uh, BitTorrent client down, then you have the content, now you can't serve it to other peers. Okay? So if you are essentially what is called a freeloader, which is you just take service but don't provide service to others, then BitTorrent will essentially start slowing you down. Okay? Because it looks at what your contribution to the network is, how much service have you provided to other peers, and how much resources have you consumed from other peers. If that ratio starts going down, which means you just try to take from others but not give, then next time you try to download content, it will actually slow you down. Each peer will send your data at a much slower rate, so your download speeds will actually slow down and it will take you longer. Okay? So it is giving you an incentive, saying participate in the network and you get good performance from others. If you just consume resources from the network but don't give back, you are going to see worse performance. Okay? So this is actually built into the system. Okay, if node P sees Q downloads more than upload, so you say that I download more than upload, then you are going to, other peers are going to keep track of this and you are going to see worse performance. So this is a way, this is actually an interesting idea which says that how do you incentivize users to behave well in a system. Okay, otherwise I have no incentive, I just want to download whatever content I want and then I am done, why should I contribute back to the network, I go and do my work. Okay? This is actually going to force you to contribute, because if you keep doing this, then in the future you are not going to see good performance. Okay? So that is an additional interesting feature of BitTorrent, but now let us look at the architecture. Okay? We talked about parallel downloads, altruism, so the architecture of this system looks like this. Okay. Essentially, there are two kinds of components in the system. There is something called a torrent file and there is something called a tracker. Okay. And then there are of course peers that actually store the content. Okay. The peers are the nodes that store a piece of a file or the entire file but broken into pieces. Okay. A tracker is a machine that is essentially an index that is going to keep track of who has this file, which node has what chunks. Okay, think of it as just a database of an index saying who has parts of the file or all of the file. Okay? And essentially a torrent is a file that points you to the tracker. So in order to download a, a piece of content from BitTorrent, you have to get a torrent file first. Okay? Torrent file is just a pointer to a tracker. Okay, a torrent file may be posted on a web server, somebody may send it to an email saying you want to download the next version of Linux, here click on this torrent file and your BitTorrent client will contact a tracker and start downloading that uh, DVD or whatever it is. Okay? So you get a torrent file, the torrent file is essentially just a pointer to a tracker for that file. So every BitTorrent content, piece of content in BitTorrent will have one torrent file. Okay? So to download that piece of content, you have to first get the torrent file okay? and then that will point you to the tracker and then you contact the tracker, it will point you to the nodes, then you directly connect to those nodes and start downloading. Okay? And the degree of parallelism is controllable. In your client, you can say I want to download from 5 peers at once or 10 peers at once, that you can set and then based on what you set or the default parameters, you will contact k out of those n nodes and start downloading in parallel. So you get the first k chunks of the file, the next k chunks and so on and so forth until you get all the chunks and then you have the entire file. Okay? Is this clear? A very different kind of uh, P2P system. There is no hash table service here. Okay? This is just a way to distribute large files, okay? data sets, software distribution, music files that you want to share. 
etc. Okay, yes. How is the tracker updated? So, tracker essentially is going to keep track of which nodes have downloaded. Every time since you are going through the tracker, the tracker knows that you are downloading this file. And so long as you are up, it is going to keep a connection live to you. So, it knows that this peer is up. So, then it knows which nodes are up that have stored this content. Okay? And if you have this content already in your cache, if you start the client, it will know this is the tracker and it will say, I am up, I have this file. So, the, you will basically contact the tracker for that file and advertise yourself. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, last question. Okay, question is if the file is split, do we, how do we agree on what the pieces are, how large they are? Those are all configurable parameters in the system. There is no uh, set choice, but you can split it in whatever way you want, say 1 megabyte chunk or 5 megabyte chunk. That is an uh, orthogonal issue. Okay, so long as you say this is the way it is going to be split, the system will take care of things. Yes, once you have split it, they have to basically keep those chunks in that. You can't re-split them or anything like that. Okay? All right. So, we are run out of time. So, we are going to stop here. We okay, continue next time.